Hi again, everyone. My name is Marissa Davis. I'm founder and principal of Talawa Consulting, and we help mission-driven brands maximize their impact by using purpose, innovation, and inclusion to drive their core strategy forward. Um, we have been having a series of really interesting conversations so far through our Talawa Talks series, where we highlight the voices and work of individuals who are working at the intersection of impact and inclusion, um, and in many ways embodying what it means to have inclusive impact. And today we have another lovely guest with us, mm -hmm. none other than Deborah Ahenkora Ose Ajikum. Um, and I am really happy that you have taken the time to join us today, Deborah. Um, she hails from Accra, Ghana, where she is based. Uh, she's a social entrepreneur whose life's work has been rooted in giving children across Africa culturally relevant books to fall in love with. Her publishing house, African Bureau Stories, is committed to providing um, that representation and provide these increased opportunities for African writers and illustrators to publish locally and internationally. She also established the Golden Baobab Prize, which is a very prestigious literary award, which over the past 10 years has discovered and supported children's book authors and illustrators across Africa. She has championed and advocated for the African children's literature industry from grassroots levels to large global stages, such as the World Economic Forum, and has received many awards and recognition for her work, uh, including being an Echoing Green Fellow, the Aspen Institute, and the Grinnell Prize for Social Justice. She's also a recipient, you know, in 2009. 2019 uh, of the Global Pluralism Award, which was given by His Highness um, the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada, which recognized her efforts for promoting African children's literature as a way to build a more inclusive world. Beyond that, she's a proud graduate of Bryn Mawr College and lives in Accra with her husband and little boy. And I am so, again, so um, excited and privileged to have you here with us today, Deborah, and um, looking forward to just having this conversation with you. So, yes, you. awesome. And so the way I usually start these conversations, the first question I ask all of my guests, which is the same that I will pose to you, um, is what is social entrepreneurship in your own words? Um, so here for me, social entrepreneurship is um, when um, business principles are applied to what were prior um, to those principles arriving, um, intractable social problems, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, I started in this space very idealistic about how problems are solved in this world. And I thought will was enough to solve problems. I thought just dedicating yourself to something was enough to solve problems. But um, 10 years in, I, I woke up one day and I was like, wait a second, this is a capitalist world. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rule of the game. And um, you win at addressing this problem if you can find a way um, to put business principles um, to um, uh, channel resources to what was prior um, an under-resourced space. And then once resources get into that space, find a way to circulate it within that industry out back in um, to just keep that machine, you know, moving. And once we, um, once we have that demand and supply moving, we begin to solve that problem because it just keeps working itself out of the rut that you know it previously found itself in. Absolutely. No, and and thank you for sharing that. And I think um the the way in which entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs in particular are using um, business principles to apply to these socially seemingly intractable social issues doesn't look the same for everyone. So I'm curious for you, how does that look 
how did your journey as a social entrepreneur begin and how has it since evolved? Yeah, so um, my journey began uh, very organically. I grew up in Ghana, loved reading books. Books were my my everything. Um, but unfortunately, most of the books that I read were in um, Ghanaian. They were white American. So at, at certain points in my um, white American, they were European. They were just like, you know, many of them were in African. So at certain points in my childhood, I, um, I would second guess some of the dreams that I had through the books that I read. And I wonder if like, you know, things like that could happen to people like me because people like me just didn't exist in these books that I dreamt about. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, you know, college, I moved to the US, I got a scholarship, I studied at Bryn Mawr. And while there, I met someone who wanted to build a library in Ghana. And I thought, you know, serendipity, um, it's, it's everything I'm about. Mm -hmm. And it's my home country too. So I got involved with that lady started organizing book drives on campus to support her one library and that blossomed into a student organization that over time shipped thousands of books um, to different libraries across the, in different countries and then one day while we were shipping those books I came across one with pictures of a little black girl and it was a real eureka light bulb moment for me because that was when I I go wait a second all of these books that we're sending don't look like the children who receive those books. And that was my childhood too. And of course, these children need these books now, but shouldn't they also have a balance of books in which they see themselves? So in that moment, um, as I was a student at Bryn Mawr, I began to discover that there was so much about my own identity as a Ghanaian, as an African that was lost because I hadn't engaged as actively um, in those identity processing or identity dreams as I had in, in white American, white European identity dreams. Um, and, you know, you know, isn't there a deep social injustice in the fact that um, some children's dreams will always be as spectators, hmm. you know, where you're standing at the window of this adventure that these little white kids are having and, you know, you're never fully able to participate or or you do and you second guess whether you <laughs> truly have a place there because you're consistently excluded when you pick up these books so like what right are you overstepping your boundaries by you know planting yourself firmly in these books because maybe you should know your place as these books seem to tell you when you don't see yourself in them mm -hmm. um so um yeah so that like those that kind of thinking is what got me to thinking the world is unjust if certain children wake up and cannot see themselves in the books they read. And certain children have been waking up for centuries seeing themselves in the books they read and loving those books, which is a big differentiator for me. There can be books that you see yourself in and don't take your magical adventures. Um, but what you need is to feel your greatest thrills in books that you can see yourself in as well as other books. It, sh it just should be a balance. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that became the beginning of my commitment to addressing this because it really, um, it was difficult for me to comprehend that we lived in a world where we dreamt impossible things like going to space, like doing commercial space travel. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't solve something as simple as ensuring that children could see themselves in the books they read and the content they consumed and love those things. Like that can be rocket science. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I was really incensed um by the injustice <clears throat> and I felt pained that my children would someday grow up in that same world where a problem this simple still stumped us because we hadn't cared enough to commit ourselves to it so I I made a commitment um to to make as much of a dent in the space as I could and it started really organically I thought I would do it a little bit and then move on but um you know I I fell in love with the work and I fell in love with the possibility of impact um, because it, it just takes one book that a child falls in love with to become, to make them a reader and mm -hmm. to think that we can do that. We can do that for children, to think that for generations to come, children will have memories in their head that we would have helped to create because we produce these really special books for them. Um, that's, 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 what, that's what my journey 
started as and um, that's a little bit what it's evolved to just um, a commitment to understanding that um, you know <laughs> you know people like Richard Branson um, Elon Musk are investing money in, in, into commercial space travel right mm -hmm. but without them we wouldn't have this conversation about about um, commercial space travel, right? Mm -hmm. So the things in the world that we care to solve about, um, that we care to solve, um, are solved when we put our resources, our commitment, and our will towards them. So for me, that's where I am. That so long as I'm consistently finding ways to channel resources into the space, I'm committed to it, and I'm garnering will for this future, this shouldn't even be the future, it should be the present, this world to exist. Um, that's how we solve the problem. That's how we solve it. Absolutely. And I mean, you had mentioned that at, 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 at the beginning of your journey, it was first this somewhat idealistic assumption or, or, or feeling of, all right, surely the will would be enough, right? Um, yeah. To get people's interest in, in um, supporting the work, for example, of ensuring that there's more representation in um, children's literature world, right? Um, but then you also speak to capitalism as it is and, and how it has existed. And so the work that you have been doing has been navigating both of those worlds. Could you speak to more specifically how through the work that you've been doing, you have been navigating those, those worlds um, and what that has looked like? Yeah. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is an important question because this is something I am still um, discovering but discovering really excitedly because it almost feels like this is for me the key the mm -hmm. key to really unlocking um, the world that we want to see but also a key that once we understand can be replicated to unlock other things that we care to see the world become so i started out with a nonprofit golden baobab um I started while I was at Bryn Mawr, and then two years then I moved, I graduated, so I moved home to build this organization. I was very blessed. I got some initial funding from Echoing Green. I got funding from Reach for Change to build this organization, mm -hmm. right? But at the time, I didn't have experience in fundraising. So my thinking was that, you know, I just need to stretch this funding out as far as I can um, so that I don't have to fundraise because I, like it wasn't something I, I thought I had the skill to do. Hmm. At a point I had to fundraise and I learned as I spoke with my other um, Echoing Green fellows or other entrepreneurs um, in the nonprofit world or even the social entrepreneurship world. Mm -hmm. Those one time we went for a party in Aspen and mm -hmm. it was full of like this, you know, this like room of full of like older, rich white people. And like, you know, the, the gang of social entrepreneurs I was with were like, you know, we have been unleashed into Candyland, like, let us go raise the money. <laughs> but here I am plagued with all of my uncertainty about the skills I know I didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and then my one friend was like, this is awesome. Like, these ladies remind me of my grandma. All I need to do is suck up to them, and I think I'm going to get that check. And I remember looking at thinking, you're so lucky. They do not remind me of my grandmother. <laughs> And I, I like if they reminded me of my grandmother, I would know how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I realized there and then that I was at this disadvantage because culturally I was forced to find resources for this nonprofit that didn't generate its own resources from a place that I didn't have direct access to. So I live in Ghana and every time I need to raise money, I, you, can't, you can't raise money for literature here. It's like, I mean, you're going to, you know, be struggling to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm raising, um, I'm raising funds internationally. And every time I have to do that, I have, so it's almost in my mind, I'm very like visual mind. In my mind, it was like I lived in a desert. <laughs> I live in a desert and every time I need to, I need water to like water my plants so they don't die. I need to trek like across like miles in the desert. 
-hmm. And my other colleagues who also have desert like gardens that they're trying to water have water in their background. Mm -hmm. If I lived in the US, I would have access to, you know, back then foundation directory online. I'd have access to all of their lots of funds I can't even apply for because I'm not American or I don't have a 501c3. So I was operating from this massive advantage. I didn't have the water that I needed for this desert um, garden. I needed to 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 have thrive mm -hmm. so that was when it hit me that look girl like this is not gonna work for you because like the, the i didn't have anything that was going to cause me to win mm -hmm. um in that situation because i'd been fed this dream that again i was the same as my american you know my american colleagues and entrepreneurs and i realized that i wasn't mm -hmm. i wasn't the same as that and I was operating from a disadvantage that I had to find a way um, to solve. So I decided to switch and, um, and, and focus more on building um, a social business, mm -hmm. whereas like whatever water I put in pumps itself right back out. I can't be sinking water into this desert because mm -hmm. the track out there is really far. So it's, you know, it was like, you know, was this me metaphorical realization, um, but that's where I came to embrace the fact that capitalism has got something right. Because what capitalism understands how to do is like, you know, it's like you go into like a fancy house and there's this like really beautiful fountain and the water is plentiful, but it's because it's the same water cycling itself in and out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I realized that that's what I needed to create. I needed to have, um, a steady stream of water coming in into my desert garden, but a system that enabled me to recycle that water so we would always have it to be able to make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And I mean, there, I think there are some who come into the social entrepreneurial world um, who similarly start in the kind of more traditional nonprofit. NGO space and and also go through this transformation and evolution to see where the social business um, side can be beneficial. So yeah. I'm curious, you know, having gone from the initial stage of mm -hmm. um, starting an NGO and now thinking um, working on the the social business itself, what what does that social business look like? Um, and, and, and how is that different from how you've operated in the past? Yeah, I mean, um, my biggest challenge always with the nonprofit was not so much, and, and this might be important to clarify, was not so much that like I lacked the skills to fundraise that I did, right. mm -hmm. but it was more so that the space that I operated in was not a traditionally funded space, right? So um children's literature is not an sdg goal mm -hmm. you know supporting african authors and illustrators is not a funding priority on many funders list mm -hmm. so we were very limited in terms of the kinds of funders we could reach to and when we found those they often had a lot of people looking for those same funds and particularly so golden baobab as much as we're children's literature we were we children's literature we were an arts and cultural organization supporting writers mm -hmm. and if you would find people supporting the arts and culture they are typically supporting their own country's mm -hmm. arts and culture right. not your country's arts and culture because Right. Arts and culture is not a development priority. So there's just like very little funding <laughs> to find for that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what forced um, the resourceful, resourcefulness and realizing that, look, girl, mm -hmm. like all of this money you're raising, if you were investing it and you were even just like recouping it back, mm -hmm. you, you, you would be in a much better position because there's just not a lot of this funding being directed towards what you're building. Mm -hmm. um, also in moving into publishing, um, we also moved into a funding priority from arts and culture, we moved into children, we moved into education. Um, so we moved into a place that better situated us resource wise to be able to address the same vision um, which, which in many ways has been my job. So when you talk about maneuvering, mm -hmm. a lot of my job has been maneuvering, um, almost to find the water bodies that I can build irrigations to my desert yeah. garden mm -hmm. to make that thrive. Um, you know, and I'm excited 
that we are at a place where I feel like we have tapped into some water bodies. We are building that irrigation um, system. And uh, if I tell you what a relief that is, you know, I've been doing this 12 years and, you know, to hit water and now have irrigation systems feels like um, gratification. Like it just feels like, you know, like we did it. We feels like we are on our way to doing it. Um, doesn't feel like we're peddling a vision as much as selling reality. And more, more importantly, it also feels like we're selling something that is a hard pressing problem for a lot more people, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're a nonprofit, you are selling something that's a hard pressing problem for a few rich people who have the money to dedicate to it, or to a lot of people who have the money to dedicate little sums to it. But it's a very different ball game from when you're selling something that they truly, truly, you know, need and have been looking, um, looking for. So it's, um, we've been um, doing some projects with corporates now who are buying books as part of like their gifting packages. And it's a delight to walk into a corporate um, and not be asking for donations, yeah. but be selling something that makes them think, give me a hundred of that, give me right. 500 of that. <laughs> it's right. just like, this is sweet. Yeah, especially as the holiday season is approaching. All right. And, exactly, exactly. Because we're solving the same problem, but from a position um, that doesn't make the work so difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. No, um, that that's, a few times do people, you know, you, you, you often hear about things after the sausage has been made, right? But seldom do you hear just sort of the mechanics of how the sausage gets made. And you're kind of speaking to um, what that looks like behind the scenes and how you shift and adapt to the current realities, um, which makes me think of just as you have been traversing this space, and I think you've in many ways spoken to this already, I imagine there have been challenges and hard lessons that you have had to learn. Could you speak to one of the hard lessons that you have had to learn and, and, and how it has helped you improve how, how you do moving forward? Yeah, I mean, there have been a bunch, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the most obvious in my mind is just the understanding that, you know, as unpleasant as it might sound to idealistic ears, money does make the world go round, you know, so just embracing that and solving for that. Mm -hmm. to make the world go around in the African children's literature space. Um, you know, I'm just like, oh, Debbie, all those years, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's one. Uh, but another one that's become very important to me um, recently is um, learning how to bring my full, full self to this work. So I'm not shortchanged. So I'm operating from an area of strength. Mm -hmm. right rather than feeling look capitalism is a system it's the game right if you're coming into the game as a two-footed man you know like a sh you're sure-footed you run your race as you should if you're coming into the game with all kinds of limbs and all kinds of like baggage and all kinds like you're at a disadvantage and the the people who built the capitalist society and the capitalist world and the capitalist machine, they look like a certain kind of person. Let's call them the white male, right? Mm -hmm. So if you fit that mold, you run through that machine really well because it was created for you, mm -hmm. right? And when you don't, you're and you try to be that, you're running, you know, with a back, like it's not who you are. So you, that race isn't built for you. Mm -hmm. So what I have come to learn um is how to run not not run because maybe i don't have two legs but how do i glide how do i dance how do i fly through that same race mm -hmm. on, on because i may have wings and you may have two legs because you know this game may not have been you know right so um for me that looks like coming to entrepreneurship as a as an African, as a woman, as a wife, as a mother, as a person of Christian faith, 
-hmm. as a person who believes in pan-Africanism, as a person who believes in the intersection of business and, and social good, but as a person who also understands that I have to play that capitalism game well, um, to serve this purpose and this cause well, mm -hmm. coming into this with all of that and not being afraid to be all of that and not feeling like I need to leave some part of it. Because once I feel like I need to leave some part of it at the door, I come into meetings thinking about what I left at the door and performing what I think I should be rather than just being myself and, and, and having that as a strength. So I, I think for me, that's a leadership lesson I wish I had learned um, a long time earlier. My faith is something that has been a driving force for me, but it wasn't something that I, I thought played a role in business. So I always separated, I always separated that, right? Um, having a life was something that I thought had a role in business. So I thought, you know, pa, pa, pa. <laughs> and you're, and you're burning out, but it's like, pa, pa, pa. And I'm just like, no, that doesn't work. Right. Um, so I feel like that's that's my big thing now. It's um, you know, it really doesn't have to be as complicated as all of that performance. Mm -hmm. It can be as simple as bringing a full self and doing you and trusting that process. And in my case, trusting God, who has been faithful from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, and who has put me on this course to deliver, um, because I've been faithful in in showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, um, part of, I think, the work of um, advancing social impact also at the intersection of inclusion and um, even in your experience, social innovation as well, um, is really negotiating those identities meaningfully in service yeah. of the work that you're doing. And yeah. um, I think you... you really answered this question already, but I just want to make sure if there's anything else that you would mention um, with regards to just how your personal identities and upbringing um, has shaped how you show up in your work. Um, is there anything yeah. else that, that, that you would want to mention about that besides all, all that you've already mentioned, which has been very helpful? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing, but maybe from a different perspective to really hammer on how um, almost nonsensical it is that we think that it could work. Mm -hmm. Like I was raised in a Christian household and I was made to believe that, um, you know, God was everything. And I started um, this business in the social entrepreneurship world where God is nothing, right? Where um, I don't have, I'm not operating in a terrain that I know that I've grown up in. I'm, I'm, I'm the stranger in the space. I'm the foreigner in the space, mm -hmm. speaking to people about a sensitive issue like money. Um, and, and to think that I will thrive mm -hmm. when I'm operating completely at odds with everything that I am just doesn't make sense um so so for me I met I I discovered um we like earlier on this year I discovered a an, an African-American entrepreneur um what was her name um Mignon Francois or Francois Mignon um so she started a cake a cupcake business she started with like ten dollars or whatever and like now she like you know, she, she's worth like, I don't her business worth like $10 million or whatever. And she was telling her story and she spoke of how her faith had played a role. And I was like, oh my gosh, I see myself finally, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's built a thriving business out of nothing, like how I was hoping to do and who had navigated her faith and it hadn't steered her wrong because I wasn't seeing examples like that. I also discovered a community called, um, um, the church for entrepreneurs and I was like faith and business and that intersection being brought together which is who I am but which was not what I was allowing myself to be so I was holding a lot of my strength back mm. um and and how do you win when you're holding your strength back mm. how, how do you win you're yeah. you're setting yourself up to not win mm. and this cycle of um this cycle of you know 
systemic um, leaving certain groups of people behind is because those people are not playing on an even playing field. You're not bringing your full selves while the others have permission to. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, um, you know, that's why representation matters so much because I was not seeing my full self represented in business. Mm -hmm. A black woman mm -hmm. who had, who was a person of faith and whose faith and, and what stood on the principles of faith to build a very successful business to like worldwide global acclaim. Mm -hmm. And once I saw that that was possible, I'm like, Holy, take me shackles <laughs> off of me. Let me out this, <laughs> you know. And it was extremely liberating. Um, and and just like so much lighter, you know. I we don't need to carry that weight. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And um, just as you're saying, representation matters within this work. Um, part of representation is inclusion, right? You know, feeling like you belong, feeling like you are, you have that level of psychological safety that allows you to present, to not perform, but to just be. Um, and I think some of that makes me think about just all that you have overcome and, 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 and thought through, you know, things that have, made you feel triumphant in the work that you have done. I would love for you to share one of those things. What are one of those wins or accomplishments you're really proud of? Um, so, yeah, this is very recent. So this happened um, about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. where um, maybe, maybe three, maybe a month, where you know, we had this massive sales target towards the end of the year okay. um, for, for, for selling our books mm -hmm. um, to companies. And, you know, we were just hitting, hitting, hitting the pavement and the conversion was really slow because, mm -hmm. you know, it's B2B so that, you know, the sales pipeline is lengthy. We knew that, but we did not have time on our side. Mm -hmm. So it had gotten so frustrating. And one morning, and before work started, I was just in my room praying. And I thought, like, dear God, we cannot be working harder than you are. Like, we are hitting the pavement. Like, we go to a meeting at 4 o'clock, we get a no. Between 4 and 5, in traffic late in a crowd, we go to two other meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, <laughs> we are pushing it to the line. Right. Um, where are you in this? And I felt God tell me, you know, focus on your job and leave mine my job to me you know you don't tell me how to do my work I'm like okay god um so I go to work and I tell my colleague um you know and and my colleague I told her I'm in the interview that you know just FYI um I'm in this space where I'm gonna be leading this business um with god <laughs> I'm going to be leading this business with Christian values are you gonna be okay with that and she mm -hmm. said yeah you know it's so long as it doesn't harm anybody. Mm -hmm. So I come to her and I tell her, listen, um, God told me this morning that we should stop going to the companies and we should just be prepared for the orders to come in. So let's do everything else, but run around like crazy chickens, like trying to score a deal. Mm -hmm. And like going into these meetings hurried, going to these meetings stressed, let's just consolidate the meetings that we've done so far and the orders will come. Um, we believe that, you know, and, you know, it's not coincidence in my books mm -hmm. that later that day, an order that, you know, they had promised might be about um, 300 books came in and it was like over 2000 books. Wow. And this is, this is a business that prior to that 2000 books was selling like 30 books a month. Mm -hmm. and we get 2000 books a day on that day where, mm -hmm. um, we decided to trust God. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the call comes and I'm like saying the numbers out loud and my colleague is looking at me like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, no, stop it. And I'm like, I have the call and I'm shell-shocked. Right. 
And I was like, yo, 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 is this God? This is just a coincidence. This is so crazy. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know about you, but (laughs) I mean, and you know, this has happened on more than one occasion. So towards the end of the year, we were writing our sales report. And my colleague says, you know, she's at the you know, the part where she's writing what our sales strategy was so that we learn from it next year. She's like, you know, Debbie, I'm writing the sales strategy, but we kind of didn't really have a strategy that way, except when we prayed. Shall I write (laughs) the official report that we prayed and the orders came? And I was like, you know, that's our truth. So we're going to write it in that report. And it's like, I am not that person. Like, Six months ago, a year ago, I was that person who was the queen of compartmentalizing. You would not know my faith or my business face. You would not, Mm -hmm. like, I was just so good. But Mm -hmm. I'd come to a point where I was like, yeah, you've got to put that in because that's what we did. And whether you believe the faith worked or not, that Mm -hmm. faith gave us confidence, Mm -hmm. right? That, that, That faith gave us focus. That faith that didn't leave us happy. That faith had us believing in something. And, you know, the world will call it the universe. But when you have that thing that you hold on to, it, it really anchors you to get things right. So do put it in that report that, yes, we did pray. And we believe that God came through. So next year, if you're reading this report to know how to do you might as well pray. Because <laughs> we don't have any other strategy to tell you work, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, for a person who believes this, you know, again, you might not believe it, but I do. To be able to bring that into my work and operate from that strength and that just like not having that stress of like wondering how to have my different identities in a play, mm-hmm. that's liberating. And that's something that other people have enjoyed for a very long time in the capitalism world because mm-hmm. it, was, it was built for them. Mm-hmm. It was built for them. Um, so it's almost like creating your own home, creating your own space and um, not forcing yourself to fit into the mold that was not created for you. And and it's interesting to me how my belief in that and my desire to have that manifest in my business work is the same belief I have in my literature work, that African children shouldn't be made to feel like they have to fit into a mold of what's African when they're reading their books. Children around the world shouldn't have to believe that there's a mold of what being African is, mm-hmm. right? And, and ch- you should be able to see your full self validated. Everybody deserves that opportunity. It, and true. it's a gift that should not be reserved for a select few who can only win you know, while the rest of us just like watch as spectators from the window cheering them on. Like that's not a just world, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, through even spaces and conversations like these, I think is just one step of many to um, offer a space for people to see and 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 um, understand the work of individuals like you who are who are trying to ensure that um, the futures that the young people coming up behind us can see a world. Um, that mirrors the one, you know, that that yeah. that they are, um, how 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 they see themselves rather. Um, so I guess one of my final questions, so the final one or two, is obviously this. As you have been doing this work, you have been doing this within the context of this COVID uh, coronavirus reality. Um, obviously the circumstances in the U.S. may be different from how they are existing in Ghana, but I am curious to know how have you been navigating your business or how has COVID impacted your um, business and how have you tried to shift to the reality in, in which we find ourselves? Yeah, um, you know, I... Um... I became a mother three years ago, um, you know, just after I started um, African Bureau, the business. And I got married, I think, a year after I started African Bureau. And so um, I was in this, like, really hectic world of trying to get this business off of the ground, learning, publishing, um, getting these books produced, 
Um, and it was just like such a hectic, hectic, hectic time. And then trying to combine that with a totally new world, like mm-hmm. marriage in a totally new world, like motherhood, mm-hmm. um, just meant that it was scaling three inc- incredibly and increasingly steep curves mm-hmm. all at the same time mm-hmm. and not feeling like you were really winning mm-hmm. at any of them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, what COVID did was... <laughs> flatten the curve almost you know and not intended. <laughs> reason one <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know suddenly you know the the incline wasn't so steep so it was almost like I, I found that I was able to catch my breath in business at home in my marriage and uh, what that did for me was that it just allowed me to see that balance was not only possible but critical like how my mama books for children when I'm not around to read my my son to sleep at night Mm -hmm. how am I getting inspiration for my work when I'm not doing that with my son every night Mm -hmm. how am I um building a solid foundation for my business Mm -hmm. when I'm not building a solid foundation for my marriage Mm. right and for my home because when those crash I go down with them Mm. right and and going down with them a part of my business goes down with that so it just again back to like the integration of all of ourselves really matters and and feeling like we have permission to do that really matters because that's when we're able to do our best sustained work when we're recognizing all of these things and serving all of these things well so it's really about deciding what that compromise looks like and as much as possible doing that without um compromising productivity success efficiency um in any one area over others um you know what what is what 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 does that equilibrium look like for me in this season Mm -hmm. and what it look like for me tomorrow and and the season after that and and leaning into that leaning into that equilibrium rather than feeling like I have to I have to be high in one and and the others can wait they none of them can wait we have to move in tandem so um I feel like COVID gave me that gift of of this you know honestly like life-changing epiphany in my life um that I feel like is moving me along healthier and and my family and my business as well yeah now that is powerful and is not something um many people speak about as 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 they are navigating the world as business owners as entrepreneurs you know the the personal worlds that they're also having to navigate so I guess my 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 final question for you and this is really for all of those who have the fortune of um seeing this conversation or hearing this conversation how can we support your work your journey um yeah just tell us all the information (laughs) Um, you know, I'll tell you the vision first. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, African Beer Stories is so proud to work with incredibly talented African writers and authors and, um, to produce, you know, stunning, fun, exciting, um, adventure filled books, um, that, that children can fall in love with. Um, beyond African Bureau and Golden Bubble, which, which I've mentioned, um, I started a partnership last year um, called Accord Literary. So my business partner, Sarah Dedina and I, so Sarah Odedina is a highly acclaimed um, British publisher. She was the publisher for the British um, Harry Potter series. So really big name in children's publishing. And Sarah and I are partnering to connect um, children's um, writers across Africa with international um, direct international publishing opportunities and we just signed a major U.S. deal where we have six titles coming out over the next three years so we're just like 
over the moon thrilled about that. Um, so do do check out um, do check out um, our books. That we the our deal was with Norton Young Readers. Okay. So do check out Norton Young Readers um, um, publishing list um, mm -hmm. for, for some African titles that we've um, done with them. Um, also check out um, and, and you said it's Norton Young Readers. Yeah, Norton Young Readers. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and our and our agency is Accord Literary. So you can check out our agency if you're an African author. We represent African authors. We would love to hear from you. Um, if you're a publisher, we sell rights to our books. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and we are also looking for partnerships actually at Accord. Um, so you spoke about in the beginning about um, how brands can operate on the intersection of of impact, inclusion, and profitability, right? Um, so what we are committed to do at Accord is connect um, African authors with the support, the training that they need so that their books can, can come out publishing ready and secure these um, opportunities for publication. And we're looking for partners who believe that African voices do need to be nurtured in that way and that these stories do need to be out in the world. We, we're looking for corporate partnership um, to really scale out these workshops and trainings for authors. Mm -hmm. um, you can also check out our work, Africa, you know, our publishing work at, at African Bureau dot com um, we have our online store and if you're interested um, to buy any of our books we ship worldwide so you can um, you can check that out you can also follow us on on social media at African Bureau HQ on all of the social media um, platforms perfect yeah. well we will make sure that this all of this information is um, included here you know for the viewers that get to check this out but more than anything you know thank you so much for spending this time uh to not only chat with me but to share your story um as as we said at the top of this conversation and certainly as you have reinforced over the course of our conversation representation matters um and certainly as you have experienced your story matters everyone's story matters so um, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, your journey, and can't wait to see all that continues to happen and grow for African Bureau Stories, for Accord Literary, for all the work um, that um, you are engaged with. So certainly just excited to see that irrigation system of yours be- Yes, girl, great. yes, girl, we're getting some water. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you again, Debbie. Thank you, Marissa. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.